Oh, my name is Mickey Munoz. Um, I've been around surfing since I was 10 years old. First stood up in 1947 or 48 and uh, got my first board in 49 and in winter of 50 I got my first real surfboard and I've been standing ever since and now for the last probably 12 or 13 or so years I've gotten into stand-up paddling. I've crossed over to the dark side but I love it and um, you know it'll 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 give me another 20 or 30 years uh, uh, surfing I'm sure. So, yeah, you know, I've never lost my passion about surfing, and I've, I've surfed all the way through. I'm now 77, so I've, I've put in a pretty long time doing it. And, uh, but during that time, I've kind of run the gamut of, of say, work. Of, you know, the restaurant business is a good one for surfing because a lot of times you can work at night. And so I started off, you know, washing pots and pans and, and scrubbing floors and dishes and, and uh, work my way up to, you know, bartender, waiter, waiting tables, manager, etc. cetera. Um, got interested in boats early on and because I surfed Malibu, there was uh, a lot of the surfers up there were multi-talented and got into uh, Malibu Outriggers, which was a real interesting boat design, a multi-hull that was an outrigger, sailing outrigger, and so that was my first real sailing experience, and because I got into shaping and designing surfboards, because at the time I started surfing, there was not a surfboard industry, so, you know, the few guys that shape boards would, would bring their balsa boards to the beach and they would set them up and, and you know, they needed a paperweight basically because they're using a draw knife to, to shape, rough shape the boards and that's a lot of drag so they needed someone to sit on the board and, and so that was my first job in the industry, or I say it was. My pay was at the end of the day they'd go up and buy beer and, and you'd sit around and burn the balsa chips and talk story after dark and drink beer. So, um, you know, coupled with the, with the restaurant business, I got into making boards, fabricating boards. I learned to shape them, I learned to glass them, and I, I got into this, you know, kind of grew with the surf industry as it grew. Um, as an offshoot, because I had some uh, talent in in composite work. Uh, I started building boats. In fact, I ended up working for a friend who had designed a boat called the Peacat, and it was a pretty unique boat. and And he needed help, so I went to work for him. Worked about eight or nine years for him, and 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 learned to build boats, learn more about composites, learn to sail them better. Uh, got into racing, got into selling them, got into marketing and with, you know, with boats. At the same time, I'm still dabbling in the surf industry and then um, part of that, uh, being a surfer uh, and growing up around Santa Monica State Beach uh, was a kind of a gathering place for an eclectic group of people and and Part of the group were a lot of film people, and so I, I met a lot of stunt, stunt guys, stunt people, and and second unit directors and stuff. And so, when the film Gidget came along, and they needed a little person to, because there weren't very many little women that surfed, uh, I ended up doubling for Sandra D in the first Gidget, and of course my line is. Now my, I used to look good in a bikini, but now my skin is wrinkled and my tits are sagging. So <laughs> that's my line. Anyway, uh, so that was a summer of work and I'm married and I've got kids and I've got, you know, I, I was able to get in SAG and which was hard to do because it was expensive. And you had to have a job, a real job in the industry. So 
I got into some stunt work and I actually doubled for Mickey Rooney in a, in a series, same name, same height, a little different shape, but, and he was a really good, he, he was a real good athlete and I'd never done fights or falls or any of that. And I signed on to the original um, thing as an expert uh, water skier, which I'd never done in my life. And luckily a friend had a water ski boat and he took me out a couple hours and showed me the basics. And so I hired on as an expert and did this stunt job, doubling Mickey Rooney. And, and actually it was very interesting. I, I won't bore you with that whole thing, but I did get into it and did get work sporadically over the years. I, I couldn't deal with Hollywood driving into Hollywood because I got to be in the water instead. And so, and I got into, so I'm working for this friend of mine building catamarans and the whole time I'm collecting sort of boxes of fittings and I, I got enough stuff here to build a boat. Of course, I never used any of it, but I, I ended up building my own boat, a 32-foot catamaran. It took me seven years to, to build it and launch it and actually launched it from this beach, like right next door on the other side of that big house. And, and, um, uh, and that took most of my adult life modifying that. And, and out of that, because I had that experience when, when Dennis Connors, was, his back was against the wall and the New Zealanders had found a flaw in the, in the, in the uh, America's Cup uh, charter, they they challenged uh, they challenged the U.S. and we had to meet the challenge or lose the cup. And so, basically, Dennis handed a friend of mine who builds boats a blank check and said, "You know, spend it. We want we want the hottest boat." So, in '88, we built two 60-foot catamarans that actually became the prototypes for the last foil-borne cats in the last uh, uh, America's Cup. And so I worked on, on that. It was 24-7 for seven months. Um, the first three and a half months, we, we started from scratch, worked, again, 24 hours a day, and built two 60-foot cats delivered to San Diego and they needed backup crew and support crew, so I went down to that and spent another three months down there um, working on those boats and, and the backup crew for Dennis. So I got to sail with him a lot and sail. He kept one of the boats after the cup, um, and I sailed like six or seven Ensenada races with him, so one of the best sailors in the world. I don't claim to be a great sailor, but anyway, it was a real privilege. So, and because of surfing and being um, kind of kind of there as it's growing, um, I got to travel a lot of the world and and surf a lot of experience a lot of different cultures and a, a lot of different breaks and 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 that's a you know a wonderful thing that I probably couldn't have afforded to do, but, you know, was able to do it at that time, so. I just kind of got on the back side of the 100-pound surfboards when, when they were balsa redwood planks, basically varnished and, and, and cumbersome, not easy to surf. And, and my first board was this paddle board, which was a hollow plywood uh, lifeguard rescue board called a Surf King Junior and uh, you know a bitch to ride and it was as weighed as much as I did but I managed to get out on it and catch waves and and kept going with it and then I got the real real board from Joe Quigg uh, in the winter of 50 and that was balsa wood covered with fiberglass well at the time there were some surfers that were working at Douglas Aircraft, and they were kind of the first ones to start using uh, polyester resin 
and fiberglass as a covering, and it turns out that that worked really well. So, you know, they're they're working with fiberglass and resin, and 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 you know they would abscond with some of the the, the materials, and they started working on boards with it. Um, and that was a huge change in, in surfboards and surfboard design. Uh, you could make them lighter and stronger, and consequently it allowed more people to surf comfortably, if you will. Uh, a lot of people say the Gidget movie was one that changed the industry. Maybe it was it certainly, um, you could look at it two ways. It, helped it, yeah, but also it hurt it because, you know, more surfers than waves and, and you know what that leads to. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so over the years, boards got lighter and, and, and stronger and shorter, narrower, more maneuverable. Uh, one of the ways I, I, I kind of describe that part of the era in the, in the mid-60s through the 70s, uh, all of the, the, the premier point breaks and reef breaks were taken up with very crowded with, with expert local surfers, and which meant that anyone beginning or intermediate were pushed out to the edges. Well, they, they went out to the edges and started riding beach breaks that we didn't really have to ride, and, and consequently, the industry, because there were so many people there on, on the edges, if you will, um, surfboard design kind of uh, went out to, to complement them. And, and, you know, point breaks, you, you take off in a wave and, and it's it, bullfighting terminology. You come as close to the horns as possible without dying. You, you want to put yourself in, in as much jeopardy as you can, but still make the wave. Well, a beach break, it's inevitable. It's going to close out. And the object became, how many maneuvers can you get before that happens? So boards changed. Styles changed. Long boards started to come back in. Short boards were predominant. And, and I was lucky enough to judge a surf competition in Baja, Mexico, and um, some of the best uh, surfers in the world, both longboarders and shortboarders, were invited to it. One of them was Kelly Slater when he was like 14 or 15 or something. Warm water, warm air, warm people, plenty of waves. Everybody's going off. It was an incredible competition. and and. Up to that point, let's say there were the two factions, the point break riders or the reef riders and the shore break or beach break riders. Um, in the finals of that competition, Kristen Fletcher and Kelly Slater. Um, waves were great. Christian is just doing phenomenal airs and, and doing all this stuff, but he wasn't really completing the dance where Kelly could put it all together. It wasn't going quite as high, not quite as tricky, but he put it all together. So I, I think Kelly was the, the point in time where he brought, he brought it all together. And surfboard design followed that, and technology followed that. And of course, you know, he's proving today he's still right there at the very, very top. So. Um, so along comes SUP. Um, you know, it had been practiced in Hawaii for I don't know how many years. I had never really seen it. Um, I'm, I go to Malibu. I'm one of the biggest swells in years. I'm paddling out on my belly and, and watching. And, you know, it's 100, 100 aggressive surfers out there all taking off and I'm, I'm waiting for that opportunity. I'm kind of dragging my feet, not wanting to get out there in the cluster. And, you know, along comes this wave that 
you know, everybody falls on or whatever happened, right? And I turn around, I take off, and I'm, I'm riding down the line I hear behind you. And I look behind me, and it's Laird. Where the hell did you come from? You know, I, sorry, and I pull out, and I wait for him to finish the wave and paddle out. And I know him, so we're talking, and I'd never seen anybody stand up paddle. He's on a 45-pound tandem board, and, and he's taken off from the second point, made it all the way through the first point, through all the chaos, and I, I didn't think anybody had a prayer in hell making it to where I was. So, you know, during the day of surfing, I asked him about, you know, what size paddle and, how, you know, what's the deal, how are you doing this, what's going on, and so he explained what he could. That day, Laird went through the pier twice. I'd never seen anybody ride through that pier in over 50 years of surfing there. I was so impressed that I came home that night and, and fumbled around in the dark and found a kayak paddle I had, and I cut it off, and I, I mixed some epoxy and glued a broomstick hand across handle on it so I could use it the next day. And, uh, and I had uh, a 12-foot board that I had designed for surf tech, a molded board, that was big enough for me to stand up paddle on. So I brought it down here, right to this beach. Surf's still big. It's almost double overhead out here. It's not easy to ride. And I, you know, stand up on this board first time and paddle out. And it took me about an hour. I finally caught a wave. and. But I was frustrated. It was much harder than I thought it would be. And you know, I finally came in and I threw the paddle on the beach and paddled back out and went surfing. But that, that's what got me started in it. And a few months later, a friend sent me a paddle, like a real paddle, like a carbon paddle. And, and that changed my whole, uh, my whole thing on, on stand-up paddling because the paddle is the real tool that that not only propels you but it it's a foil when you're surfing and so that got me into it and um, the same time uh, my wife is a real athlete great swimmer great great uh, runner and all-around athlete water person uh, she started paddling she got into it big time and uh, so it's something that we've been able to do together and and really have fun doing and and so uh, you know along comes Sparky Longley who gets into it rainbow sandals and 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 he and Jerry get together and go well let's have a real battle here let's have the paddle of the battle or the battle of the paddle or whatever it is right and kind of no rules and and you know let's go for it so uh you know i've known sparky for 50 years and and you know got into not only competing in it but i get to be a referee i get to put on striped shirt and go out and go surf all day which i love <laughs> Okay, the fountain of youth. <laughs> um, luckily, I got invited to go on, a, on an Indonesian trip with, with uh, Yvonne Chouinard and the Patagonia crew. We're on a 60-foot all-steel catch, sails up, 1,000 horsepower, diesel engine. We're coming around one of the islands. We've been surfing a break called Scar Reef. Gnarly break. Anybody that hangs out there very long, they got scars all over them. But we're going around to reputedly one of the best surf breaks in the world, which is Desert Point. It's the middle of the night. We're reaching in, in trade wind. We're, we're coming around the island. It takes us four hours to go the next four and a half miles because of the current. So there's this tremendous current running around the island. Now picture Desert Point. We're anchored inside the point, the point sticking out. You've got waves coming unimpeded from, from uh, uh, Antarctica. 
So they come wheeling around the point like spokes on a bicycle. You've got a 10 knot current running straight into the wave phase. And it's a way easier takeoff than, than Scar Reef, but it's a growing wave. As it comes in and goes down that reef, it gets bigger and gnarlier and hollower and more radical. You've got a reef that's knee high, dry out of the water with all this current and all the water rushing off that reef. We get there, it only breaks at a certain tide. When we get there, it doesn't look like it's gonna break at all. In three hours, it's now almost double overhead. So we've got it. So I paddle out, get a bunch of waves and, and I take off on a probably the best wave I've ever been in. Barrel, anyway double overhead, just cranking wave. And I'm, I'm, it, I don't go left that often. I only go left if I have to, but you know, I had to then. So unbeknownst to me, Yvonne is standing on the reef, on the dry reef. He, his board's broken in three halves, in three pieces. He's got the tail with the fins on it and his leash on tucked under his arm. And he's wondering what the hell to do because here comes this wave that's going to break on, looks like it's going to break on the reef, right? So at the last second, he dives off and trailing this piece of board. And I'm in this wave fully focused going, I, I, don't, I don't think I can make it, but I'm, I got to go for it. That's all you can do or die. Oh my God, I'm going to hit a turtle. It wasn't a turtle. It was the, it was the tail of... Yvonne's board. So I, anyway, I make it down this thing way further than I ever thought I could, 100 yards down the beach, and finally drive through the top of the wave. I don't die. I come out with this shit-eating grin on my face. I'm just, yeah, you know, I don't need to ride another wave in my life, right? So I paddle back to the boat. A couple months later, Yvonne calls me and says, hey, would you ride a little piece for the catalog? So I got thinking about it, and I got thinking about my elation and how I felt after that wave. And I, I described this whole, you know, set up my little article with describing the point and the, and the current and, and just the whole setup and the illusion of speed, because speed is really an illusion. You know, you, you walk at 5, you run at 10, you, you drive your car at 80, and you get in a plane and go 600, you know, but it's all about illusion. It can either feel fast or slow. Time slows down or speeds up. So I got thinking about it and I got, okay, Einstein theorized that if you and I are standing here on the beach and you get picked up by a spaceship and you can leave here and exceed the speed of light, then when you come back, you would land younger than when you left. I theorized in that barrel, the illusion of speed and the whole setup, the whole thing with the noise and the wind and the current and the whole visual part of it, the illusion of speed was so great, I exceeded the speed of light, I came out physically, chemically, you know, different than when I went in, I came out younger. Surfing is the fountain of youth.